The world of American open wheel racing has had a complicated relationship with the United Kingdom. Throughout well over 100 years of IndyCar competition, only five races have been held in the country. Silverstone in 1978, Rockingham in 2001 and 2002, and Brands Hatch in 1978 and finally 2003. A race set to be talked about in this channel in a video later this week. Ever since 2003, there's been no IndyCar races in the British Isles. Not in the UK, Scotland, Northern Ireland, or even Wales for that matter. I wasn't even conceived when IndyCar last race in the UK. And for the British IndyCar faithful, which there are a lot of, they must feel left out. However, they're also probably looking at the ongoing rumors of IndyCar going to foreign markets and believe they deserve a chance. So what would a new IndyCar race in Britain look like? What track would the series run at? How would the racing be? And most importantly, could it actually happen? Well, let's go through all of that, as in this video I'd try and figure out whether or not IndyCar's racing in the UK could, should, or would happen. Alright, so before we get into setting up this what-if event, I want to go over the three tracks in the UK that IndyCar has raced at in the past and go over why I have my doubts that any of them will make a return. The most obvious one is Rockingham, which last held a race of any kind in November of 2018. The track is currently owned by a car auction company, and is used as car storage and a filming site for the owner's YouTube channel. Barring a miracle, no racing series will ever return to the track, let alone IndyCar. Next up is Silverstone, which I just have a hard time believing will ever return to the IndyCar schedule. It would be pretty damn awesome, but I think there's other tracks that IndyCar would go to first, mostly because renting Silverstone for a weekend would cost an arm, a leg, two kidneys, and probably a lung, and the event would probably still be deep in the red after two or three years. And finally is Brands Hatch, and if IndyCar were to run there, it needs to be on the full circuit, I feel, and plus Brands Hatch is not a really good circuit for racing, I feel, so if IndyCar were to come back to the UK, I think it should and would be at a new track for the series. The track I have my eyes on is Donington Park, which has existed in some form or another for decades. I personally think that's a fitting circuit, and would play well with the Indy cars. To be more precise, I opted for the Grand Prix layout, and for those unfamiliar with the track, here's a quick little track guide for myself. The Dyington Park Circuit is a very interesting track with a very interesting history. It was a fixture of pre-World War II Grand Prix racing back in the 30s. It was really the, uh, the premier venue of pre-World War II Grand Prix racing in the United Kingdom. And it's still a very fantastic circuit with an old-school flair. It's FIA Grade 2 certified. So it's not like the Grade 1 circuits you see on the F1 calendar nowadays, which are so smoothed over and racetrackified that all their character is going with it. But it's still a very challenging course with a lot of very interesting corners. We're coming up to one right now. The final Final corner, which is of course going to be very important to try and get a good exit here uh, and get onto that start finish straight away with a good amount of speed to start off your lap and style there. Have a little bit of uh, kick out action there coming out of the final corner, but never mind that. We are on the start finish straight away, barreling towards turn one, which is a tricky corner to get right, especially on cold brakes and cold tires like I am now. But we go through there fairly smoothly. It's a corner where you don't really want to make a mistake on because there's no asphalt runoff to speak of. There's a small little bit here as we approach the old hairpin here, which was never really a hairpin on the track. It was just called hairpin when it was pretty much the exact same corner, but we go through there fairly smooth. Not a whole lot of asphalt runoff to speak of even today. And then we go through the other uh, double left and go into this very heavy braking zone for the other uh, right near hairpin, hairpin. And then we have a little short stretch here little bit of an uphill braking zone there, a bit blind as we go through this double right-hander, which is very tricky. It would certainly be tricky for these drivers if they were to run it in uh, in wet conditions, trying to get the throttle on coming through there. That would be interesting to see. Then we go into the chicane, try and brake as late as you dare, coming through there, hit that curb a little bit, and the cart's, uh, car starts to bounce a little bit there, and it uh, feels like you yeah, have a pogo stick underneath, but never mind that. We go into the hairpin, which is very tricky. You have a downhill braking zone, a little bit of off-camber action, and then you're uphill trying to apply the power and you have this blind final corner which is very tricky to sight at you can barely see the curb until it's too late there it's a very tricky corner probably the most pain in the ass corner on all of this track but still Donington is a unique circuit with some interesting flair to it I'm sure the drivers of the NTT data IndyCar series would have a fantastic time racing here in real life Here's some third-person views now, and you'll see some of the laps I did a few weeks ago while I talked through my choice. As fun as the National Circuit is, and as much as I dislike that final turn, the Grand Prix layout has more overtaking opportunities, and stretches the lap times over the one-minute mark. I said a scrappy one-minute 16, but a better driver who wasn't running on five hours of sleep could probably shave that lap time by a few seconds. It'll still be a lap record regardless, and I think the IndyCars would play very well here. The driving experience was pretty neat, but also very challenging. The amount of time 
times I've gone off at the old hairpin over the years is pretty embarrassing for me to recount. The chicane is really difficult to get right, and the elevation change makes this track a hell of a ride. There's other challenging parts of this combination, but that's not meant in a bad way. So what I'm going to do for this next segment is take complete creative liberty and create my vision of IndyCar's return to the UK. The Donington Indy Grand Prix would be a 100 lap, roughly 250 mile race at the Donington Park Grand Prix circuit. The race would be held in the summer, late July or early August. The race would be a championship points round. IndyCar needs to get the idea of having a non-championship race abroad because they need to go all in or nothing on racing internationally. This would be the best way to go about things, setting up a new event to run for a few years in a market that has been left dry for over two decades. As much as the UK has more Formula 1 fans compared to IndyCar, there's still a faithful nucleus of fans. Hell, the UK wouldn't be my second biggest demographic if that wasn't the case. It'll probably be a bit hard for the teams and the series to make a profit off of this race, but the idea around a three-year contract is testing the waters of the UK market. If not for a big injection of sponsorship money, the race will probably need a great turnout in order to break even. So now with a mock event set up, maybe I should give this combination a whirl in a race setting. Test how the track is for racing, all of that. I'll be using the iRacing AI, and once again, you'll hear me talk through this quick little race. Alright, so we are loaded up here once again in iRacing, this time with a 30-car uh, race, four laps here at the Donington Park Grand Prix layout. We've got 29 AI and myself. I'll be starting last of this 30-car uh, pack here. Of course, in real life, we'd probably have closer to like 28, 27 cars actually racing here, but still a uh, pretty stout amount of uh, drivers that would be racing at this track, more than Formula One ever had here at this circuit, so that'd still be a very hectic race. Definitely lap traffic will come into play, but with this four-lap race, I doubt lap traffic will be a very big issue for us here today, so we are coming through the, uh, the final few corners here. One thing that I must say is that in real life, chances are we'd probably start using the, uh, the national layout, which bypasses this dogleg section here. As you can see, we're going extremely slowly here, about 20 miles an hour as we go through the Melbourne hairpin. But I think we'd probably use the, uh, the chicane and uh, skip out on this dogleg to, uh, to have a, a much smoother run uh, towards the start-finish line. That would be something to keep an eye out for if this race ever happened, because here, starting around the hairpin, it gives a, uh, a long beach feel, but never mind that. We got the green flag while well, a lot of drivers stacking up here. That caught us out a little bit, so we had to... Uh, get out of the throttle there when we should have been on the gas, but still drivers going side by side here Gonna try and peek a wheel here peek a wheel or two or three or four. Ooh, might be going three wide I'm gonna hit the brakes there Scrap the brakes a little bit and back out that. Ooh, that was extremely close there with that driver. Oh Boy lots of stacking up here coming through the old hairpin that is something that, hope to God, would not happen in real life. That's a very tricky corner. Would probably see some accidents there in real life. Certainly not discrediting the other uh, drivers in IndyCar, but the drivers in IndyCar are usually fairly aggressive. So it would be just one driver making a simple mistake. They're either leading their braking on a little bit too late. They're getting caught out or just going for an overly opportunistic move very early on to uh, create a big and a very bad situation coming through the hairpin. But we did not have that here. Well, I say the hairpin. It was called the hairpin now it's called the old hairpin even though it's never really been a hairpin in this track's entire existence but never mind that enough with me being pedantic we've had a nice start here so far my pico wheel coming down the inside of the melbourne hairpin running all four tires onto the lawn there actually so to the driver up ahead so Definitely a very tricky corner, a tricky corner to get right, but that would be a very good overtaking opportunity for many of the drivers in real life. It certainly is in real life for any of the series that race here at Donington Park. It's a track that doesn't have the most amount of overtaking opportunities in the world, but you can peek a wheel there and you can definitely try and force a move there if you feel so inclined. So we're speaking of forcing a move, we're trying to go around the outside, coming through turn one. I was going to thread the needle there, but I don't want to... Oh boy, that's a big moment for me. Hit the curb there and unsettle the car quite badly. I was going to say that I was going to go three wide, but with that massive moment there, as we neared the old hairpin, I think I nearly crapped myself there. That was pretty terrifying. But never mind that, we are still in this race. Have closed up quite nicely, doing a little bit of lawn mowing coming out of that corner. And here, oh boy, dirty air playing a little bit of uh, a little bit of an bit of an effect here that could be something that we see if Donington uh, Park ever hosted an IndyCar race. Dirty Air would probably be, play a uh, pretty significant role in the other uh, racing action. You can see the car bouncing like a, uh, a glitched out bull there. It just 
bouncing quite badly coming through that chicane. That would be something that uh, the track operators, which is actually Jonathan Palmer, the other uh, old Formula One driver, he owns the other company that owns uh, this circuit and many other tracks. I believe he also owns Snetterton, Alton Park as well. Any logo that's very similar to the Donington Park one with a kind of like a red checkered flag sort of logo thing. It's all owned by Jonathan Palmer and his company, which I believe is called Motorsports Vision. So uh, Jonathan would probably have to look into um, fixing that and uh, trying to uh, just fix the other cars bouncing badly through there. That or it could be a small little glitch here with this iRacing scan. Uh, obviously, I've never driven at Donington Park. I don't even have a passport to get into the UK. So, um, yeah, that would be... If that does exist in real life, they would definitely have to fix that because I'm sure the IndyCar drivers would not be very happy uh, feeling the other uh, shock waves of those bumps as they went through the other uh, chicane there. That'd be very bad through their lower and middle back. As someone who's been out of the cart since... Uh, who took himself out of the cart back in May because of uh, some middle back issues. That would definitely not be the best situation in the world for the IndyCar drivers, but we saw a driver attempting a move there coming into the chicane. Wouldn't see too much of that in real life. That's not a corner that you see some side-by-side -side action through. So a little bit of side-by-side -side action there when I was commentating the ARL GT3 series a few weeks ago here at Tonington Park, which actually hosted the penultimate round of the season. Saw so some drivers going side-by-side -side through there, and it always ended badly. So that's not a corner that you'd expect to see any side-by-side -side action through in real life, but we're on the final lap now. I've been kind of just cruising throughout most of this. We're running in P22, not the best race for me. But I'm more focused... Ooh, God, that was a big curb hit there. But I'm more focused on trying to give some... Uh, uh, somewhat useful, probably useless insight here as we uh, tick down the laps here. That was probably my best run coming through the old hairpin. That's a very tricky corner. I outlined that as I went on my uh, lukewarm lap. Some would call it a, a hot lap. I'd call it a lukewarm lap. But still, ooh, big slide coming out of that corner there. Just, yeah, this, cor this car is very tricky. It's uh, definitely not the most easy driving experience in the world. You can see the, uh, the force feedback graph on the, uh, the top right-hand side of the screen. It's usually in the red when we come through some of these corners because this IndyCar does not have power steering in real life, and they don't try and simulate that uh, here in iRacing. So the steering is very heavy, definitely a little bit of an arm workout if I didn't have the, uh, the force feedback turned down a little bit. So you won't hear all the creaking of the rig, but as I've been talking, snagged a wheel there coming into the Melbourne hairpin there. And now we've got an AI trying to go side by side with me. I overshoot that corner terribly. And I'm going to actually lose that position unless I can get a great exit here. We're on push to pass. It's going to be a drag race. I don't think it's going to be enough for me. Ah, damn. That's, um... Yeah, not the best race in the world, but, um... It's a, it's a very challenging circuit, and it's uh, definitely very driver skill oriented. So me as a fairly mediocre driver didn't put on the best show there, but I'm sure the drivers and the Indy cars would be given 110% all the time and not just bollocking around into a microphone on iRacing. So that's a uh, quick little race there here at Donington Park in the IR18 Indy car here in iRacing, and that was definitely an interesting experience indeed. So now that we have a rough idea about whether or not this combination could work, and I've already said how this probably won't happen in the near future, I'm yet to say if I personally would want it on the IndyCar calendar. Honestly, I'm a bit conflicted. I've held this opinion for a while, and I'll still stand behind it. If IndyCar wants to expand internationally, they need to focus on North and South America. We need one more race in Canada, at least one or maybe two races in Mexico, one in Brazil, and another in Argentina. Focusing on the series presence in the Americas should be IndyCar's focus for now, so I really don't think eyeing a return to the UK should be on the cards for now, but I do believe that at least a small little bit of international expansion should be important. Get rid of a race like Detroit and go to a much better circle like Autodroma Hermanos Rodriguez in Mexico City. Under no circumstances should General Motors be upset with that decision. After all, only 56% of the cars built by GM yearly are actually built in America, but my disdain for General Motors can be the topic of its own video. Getting back on track, I feel the current IndyCar schedule could accommodate more international races. Maybe a return to the UK UK could be on the cards one day, it's just today is not that day. If it were to happen, I'd expect 2026 or later to be when it pops up on the IndyCar schedule. This video isn't a call to action, it shouldn't be, but what it is is a small idea that with the right series of events and the right people behind it, could snowball into the return of American Open Wheel to the British Isles. Thank you all for watching, and have a great afternoon.